Welcome to this episode of What's Going On with Shipping. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. So this year, we're going to be featuring special guests on the YouTube channel. You may have seen our last episode with John Conrad, where we looked at 2021, talked about predictions for 2022. One of the names that got mentioned is our guest today, Jay Mintzmeyer, who does stock in shipping. So Jay, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Hey, thanks, Sal. I appreciate you having me on. I, I've been a huge fan of your show the last year. The supply chain stuff's been crazy, and, and you're definitely feeling a need of explaining really what's going on. And I, I didn't think I'd be on the show, but I'm, I'm excited, and I'm ready to share you know, my expertise, which, of course, is investing in that segment. Well, Jay, I, I think we can equally fanboy each other. I've been following you on Twitter for a long time. Uh, I follow your YouTube channel, too. You have your own YouTube channel, and I'll be sure to include your t- YouTube channel in the show notes. You can link to it right up here and go right over to Jay's webpage and his YouTube. You can check him out directly. So before we get jumping into shipping stocks and all the craziness that has been 2021 and what's gonna be 2022 in the future, I I wanna talk a little bit about your background, how you got into this area, because you have a very diverse background. You know, I'm looking at the back right behind you is a picture of a drone. So, you know, your your background is a little unique to for coming into shipping. So I was wondering if you could just introduce yourself to the uh, people here at what's going on with shipping. Yeah, absolutely, Sal. I, I went to the wrong military academy. You know, I went to the Air Force Academy. I, I guess I should have went to the Benicosti or, or went to Annapolis or something. I, all jokes aside, um, very happy with the school I graduated from. But uh, no, you know, I've been interested in shipping and global trade since I was a little kid, you know, seeing trains going by my house and seeing some of the ships when we were by the ocean and just curious, you know, what's going on? Where are those, where is those cargoes going? What's inside those train cars? Um, and then when I got to college, I uh, majored in economics. And so I started getting a little bit more into the financial markets. And by the time I was about a junior to senior in college, I, you know, I didn't have much money, a few thousand dollars, but I had a brokerage and I started dabbling in stocks. And this was right after, <clears throat> right after the global financial crisis. Um, and one of the sectors that had been really hard hit was shipping. And so I was like, oh, those are interesting. I, I remember being curious about shipping as a kid. And so I just started following the industry. And of course, as you know, Sal, and as everybody probably listening knows, that was a very rough time to be investing in shipping. And I didn't really have any money at the time, so it was more academic anyways. Um, but I followed the sector. And then by the time we got to around 2014, uh, things had started to turn around. The sector was sporadically having decent profits. There was different segments to invest in. And I realized how wild these stocks traded. They're all small caps. Um, they're not really penny stocks, but they're all you know, 50 million, 200 million, 300 million, pretty small companies. And so that means a lot of the bigger hedge funds can't play in this in the sandbox. So there wasn't a lot of great you know, market research out there. Um, it's much different today. There's a little bit more research available, but uh, you know, I would see these stocks swing wildly, wildly up, wildly down, and, and they didn't seem to follow the underlying fundamentals, you know, cash flows and supply demand and that sort of thing. And so I, I had the idea or the belief back in about 2013, 2014, that this was a segment we could make money in. And uh, 2015, uh, I launched Value Investors Edge. And so t- about the middle of 15. And 2016 was our first year. And uh, we've been doing it now for six full years. This will be our seventh. Uh, 2022 will be our seventh. And you know we've outperformed the shipping industry by about 40% per year and outperformed the Russell 2000 by about 25% per year. So I, you know, I, I had an idea in 2015 that we could make this happen, uh, but it's come to fruition and it's come to fruition in a segment that I personally find interesting, which makes you know, going to work fun, right? I, you know, analyzing these stocks, is, it, it was my hobby starting out, but now it's something I do and I, I enjoy it. It's fun. You know, I, I joked with you about it that I, I got into the wrong side of the shipping business. You know, I, I sailed on ships for three years. I worked ashore for them for four years. And I joked, it's like, man, I never realized really, you know, even on the operations side where I was dealing with budgets and the, and the daily operations of, of fleets of vessels, never really got into the stock side about it. And, and I, it's really fascinated me quite a bit, especially this past year, obviously. It's, it, it's been just crazy to watch. Uh, before we jump into it again, I just, I just want to clarify a couple of things because I think it's really interesting what you do. So a lot of people know, you know, hedge funds, they've seen it on TV and movies and everything like that. What, what exactly does your business do and how is it different than what is kind of typically uh, portrayed out there? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question and something to clear up. So, you know, right up front, we don't manage any money. We don't give any sort of investment advice. So, you know, someone joins our platform and says, hey, I got, you know, $500,000 and I want to invest it in shipping. Well, oh, hey, that's nice, you know, <laughs> cool, cool story. But, you know, all we do is provide research reports. We have model portfolios, which are companies I personally believe 
are going to outperform. And that's how we track our performance, the, the statistics I just mentioned earlier. And, you know, I disclose my personal trades. And I'll say, hey, I'm, I'm long, uh, for example, International Seaways, INSW, which is a company I actually am long. But I would post that. I would say, you know, I, I, I won't necessarily say exactly how many shares, but I'll say, you know, I bought a 5% allocation at, you know, 1550 or whatever. And, you know, folks can follow that and, and they could either, you know, if they wanted to, they could maybe copy the trade or they could buy stuff that's in the model portfolio, but there's never any sort of recommendation or in, no, in nothing investment. I always tell folks to use their own tax, legal um, investment advisors. Um, we don't manage anybody's money. Um, I only manage my own personal accounts. So that's really what separates us. I, you know, a hedge fund is one that, you know, of course, manages other people's money. And then some of these investment advisors are the ones that actually tell you, you know, hey, Joe, buy 500 shares of, you know, international seaways. We, we don't do that. Right. And obviously this, this past year has been crazy. I, mean, I don't know how, how else to put it. You know, there's a lot of adjectives I guess I could use, but I'll, I'll stay with crazy because I think it's the, the best one and it keeps us PG rated. But, you know, I have to go back to 2008 to see a crazier year when you have the global recession that comes in. So before we jump in, you know, what was your reflection on the past year? I mean, obviously you've seen the different areas and I know you tend to look in, in three specific areas. I think it's containers, uh, bulkers, and tankers mainly, not so much the cruise lines and, and some other areas, but those seem to be the three areas you tend to look at. So what's your reflection on, on what has been the year 2021 so far and leading up to that, obviously? Yeah, no, absolutely. 2021 was a record-breaking year for us. Our, our model portfolios were up an average of 136% wow. between the two of them. Yeah, the, the speculative account was up almost 185%. And the best risk reward, the more conservative stuff was up about 80%. So the, yeah, the average of those two shipping portfolios, 136%. You know, that's the kind of year that, you know, honestly, and I'm, I'm a younger guy, but if I never have another year like that in my lifetime, uh, that's probably okay. I mean, that's like almost a decade of returns in, in, in one year. So we're very happy about that. But 2021 was also kind of a tale of, of two halves. The first half um, going from January through about mid-June was there's a lot of macro tailwinds helping us out. Not only were the fundamentals good for shipping, there was kind of a broad rotation into these reopening stocks, into some of the more value and small cap stocks. Um, you also saw totally weird, you know, tech small caps like the ARK ETF was doing really well. So there's a lot of things that were tailwinds for us. And we produced of that 136% uh, I mentioned, we produced about 110% of that um, in the first half. So just huge tailwinds. And if you annualize that, it's insane. It's over 200%, of course. Um, and then the second half, we did well, um, but we did about 20%. Uh, returns. And, and that was because a lot of those tailwinds shifted to headwinds. The Delta variant came out in June. Uh, folks started looking at shipping stocks and saying, whoa, they've all went up three times. You know, I don't want to invest here anymore. Um, it became harder, um, I suppose, to attract new money to the sector because folks who didn't really understand what was going on would look at a stock like Zim and say, oh, it IPO'd at you know, $15 and now it's 30. Like I'm too late. Right? They didn't understand that, no, it can go much, much higher. And, and so the second half was, it was kind of, a, kind of a headwind. And I, and I think, hopefully, as we turn into 2022, recording the first week here, uh, you know, I think it's kind of half and half. I, I think there's still some headwinds. There's still some skepticism. Uh, we're probably past the very, very peak of some of the craziest stuff. Um, but I think also there's going to be a little bit more trend towards smaller caps, towards value stocks, uh, rotation away from some of this tech stuff, uh, focus on maybe th some things that do well in inflation. So I think those sort of macro head, uh, factors are going to kind of give us a neutral to slightly positive uh, tailwind. Yeah. And I think if you look, I mean, if you go really macro, I mean, if you look at prior to 2008, where shipping was, I mean, we're not even at that level where they were back in the early 2000s. I, I mean, there was a huge peak there, early 2000s, that was just amazing to see. And, and I think people forget how big that drop was in 2008. And, and how slow that recovery was and, and all the factors associated with it. And, and as you said, you know, Zim is one of those ones that, that you and I know have watched quite interestingly. It's been amazing to watch that IPO. And, you know, the idea that, that they're at the end of the, where they're going to be is, 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 I think, misjudging where the industry is right now and, and, and issues going forward. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, obviously everyone talks supply chain and, and supply chain involves multiple facets and, and they're the facets you're in. You've got the container sector, you've got the bulk sector and bulk involves ore and, 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 grain, and grain and involves multiple types of bulkers too. And then obviously there's the oil side, which we saw an amazing peak early in 2020 because everybody stopped driving. And, and then it 
bottoms out. And, and now we're, we're in a really kind of interesting place with it. So I was wondering if you can kind of go through the sectors, talk about it a little bit and, and how the supply chain has really impacted the financial side. I think everybody knows from me the issue with LA Long Beach and, 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 and the, the, the jam and go Christmas shopping early and things like that. But on the finance side, it's been really amazing to, to see what has evolved. Yeah, no, absolutely, Sal. And, and I'm excited to be on this podcast because this is the first time um, where, we're, where I'm speaking, shipping and talking to segments with someone who probably knows more than I do in, in terms of like the supply chains and, and some of the dynamics. So I'll do my financial side, um, but I'm sure you actually have maybe more of that than I do, which usually is not the case, right? Usually the financial podcast is very generalist and they're asking me, you know, very basic. So this will be hopefully a little bit more of a deep dive. Um, on the container ship side, yeah, I really like what you've been doing with, with covering LA Long Beach. And of course, as you know, the global supply chain situation, it's like a nasty body covered with warts and, and LA Long Beach is just the hairiest and grossest of those warts, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things going on and LA Long Beach just happens to be <laughs> like the most, the most uh, crazy. So container ships, um, there's 12, 13, 14 different issues in that supply chain. And, and you've covered a lot of them on your, on your supply chain channel, whether or not it's uh, truck availability, whether it's uh, dock workers not available because of COVID lockdowns, a global shortage of ships, uh, it, the, the way they're doing the queuing system and then forcing ships back further out, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I think we're a little bit from an investment standpoint, um, I think we're past the craziest points of some of those rates. I mean, some of the stuff that was going on in, in, September, you know, that we had the hyper to merge and we had FEUs, uh, 40 foot equivalent units going for over 20,000 on average. I, I don't think we're going to see that again. But when I look at the base rates, and those are what are reported by what's called the Shanghai Containerized Freight Index, SCFI, the underlying base rates, which is just what it costs to ship a 40 foot container globally without surcharges, you know, without the guaranteed slots, without the demerged attention, that sort of stuff. They're basically at all time highs. So the cost to ship stuff worldwide is, is still way up there. Um, it's just some of the crazier fees and, and things that, you know, importers squealed about, uh, you know, some of those have been reined in a little bit. Um, for the investment side of things, I would say we're probably somewhere between like fifth to seventh inning. The rates might be eighth or ninth inning, but I think investment side would fifth to seventh because there's this wall of worry. There's all this skepticism. You know, folks think, oh, the rates are going to crash, you know, basically tomorrow. Uh, they're not going to be here by mid-22 or late-22. And I have a different view on that. I, I think 2022 is also going to be very, very strong here for the liners. Uh, for some liners, uh, 22 might even be stronger than 21, which is <laughs> almost unbelievable. I, I don't think two months ago I would have said that. Uh, but the stuff we're seeing today suggests that. So that's the one where we've been the most involved in. That's given us most of the gains in 21. Um, bulkers are a spot. Before, before you jump into yeah. bulkers, Jay, just because because I I, I, I I agree with you. I, I think 2022 is going to be a really interesting year to see it. And while you're on the containers, talk about that for a second. I think it's really interesting how the container liners are going to be spending their profits. I mean, something they have not really had in their hands since, again, pre-2008 record profits in their hands. And I think one of the really interesting things to watch on the container liners is how they spend those profits. What are they doing with that money? You know, Maersk is buying an e-commerce outfit. You know, some container liners, CMA, CGM is buying a, a, a terminal. You know, if you go back to when they were flush with cash again, prior to 2008, what were they buying? They were buying ships. They were buying ships and not just ships, but mega ships. They were buying yeah. the ultra large container vessels, which did not serve them well when the market crashed in 2008. And then they were stuck with these big, huge, massive ships and not able to fill them up. I think the, 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 the thing we need to be really careful about is where those container companies are spending their money. And also there's a heck of a lot less of them today than they were back in 2008. They've consolidated like crazy. Where are they going to be purchasing up smaller lines? You know, I was watching this little bit between HMM and SM lines. You know, are they going to gobble each other up? There's a, there's a small uh, uh, Singapore based line, PIL. You know, that was really on the blocks. Now it's, it's really financially strong right now. It, it, it's, I, I think one of the things we really got to be seeing is how these container liners, are, how smart are they with their investment? And I agree with you. We're not going to see $1,500, 2000 rates going across the Pacific again because, number one, I think the, the container liners are a lot smarter now. They've consolidated. They're in their alliances. They're, they're not going to be eating their own so much. And you're right. I, I tend, you know, my view is, is, they have learned a lot. They like these profits a lot. They're making huge profits with decreased reliability, which means they're getting more money for poorer service. <laughs> and, and there's yeah. not a lot of reason to change that model in, in, in their minds. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, I, I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. 
Well, I, I think one of the parallels for big picture folks, and I, I think most of the viewers on your channel are, are probably a little bit more into shipping, so they understand this, but one of the parallels would be global airliners, especially the U.S. super majors, <clears throat> um, American Airlines, Delta, United, those kind of companies. Um, in the 90s and even early 2000s, especially post 9-11, there was a bankruptcy every other week you know, in, yeah. in that sector, and they could never make money. And, and now airliners, even during COVID, were super profitable. I mean, it, obviously with COVID, there was a gap in their cash flows, but even now they're extremely profitable and, you know, and, and there's still competition, right? It's not a monopoly. It's not even an oligopoly, but it's just rational competition, rational capital allocation. And, and I think if you look at the global airliners, there's even more global airliners uh, serving, you know, different areas than there are container liners. So I, I guess I agree with you that I think, we're, you know, the container liners of the last 10 years were kind of like the airliners of the early 2000s. And if you look at how the global airliners did from 2010 to 2020, I think that could give you a sample of how these shipping liners are going to do from, say, 2021 to 2030. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, almost, I know it's a sector outside of you, but I think the passenger liners find themselves in the same position the container lines found themselves in 2008. They overbuilt. They invested. They, 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 they could not see any problem on the horizon that was not going to be an increase the following year. And then COVID hit and they just dropped. I mean, plummet if you ever look at their their graphs it, it's just like off a cliff and, and they're only at about half the value they're at and they're still having issues mm -hmm. and, and i and i think that's where the container liners were you know in the early 2010s yeah. is, is where you saw them in those kind of fluctuations we're making a profit this quarter but not this quarter and right. it was really just just eking it out L yeah. let's jump over to the bulk sector which i i find really interesting i just i love talking about the bulk sector because i think this is the growing sector in the maritime fleets if you look at the biggest number of ships out there, the tonnage that's being built out there, it, it is in the bulk sector. And, and it's also the one that has the biggest, I think, potential to grow even further. I mean, China, we like to think China is a huge exporter, but they're not. They're a huge importer. They need grain and ore and all these commodities coming in. We forget how interconnected we are. So let me jump over to the bulk sector with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, dry bulk is, is the one area that intersects a lot with my academic interests. Uh, for those who might not know, I'm, I'm currently a PhD student at the Harvard Kennedy School, where I'm studying international trade flows and specifically focused on Chinese economic statecraft, Chinese resource dependency, uh, that sort of stuff. So dry bulk really intersects and interweaves into that. I, I, I'm just, um, I, I can't help but apologize for the schooling you've had. I mean, the Air Force Academy, now Harvard. I mean, obviously, obviously you just got to up your game a little bit, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, I've, been, I've been blessed and, and fortunate to, to have this experience. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not the, uh, I'm not the sharpest student in any of my <laughs> classes, but uh, at least I know what I'm talking about in shipping, right? <laughs> It, 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 if you got to have a field, you just you, you master your field, and that, that's what I always live on, Jay. So that's ahead. always that's always the play. So when we're talking Chinese geopolitics, I, I might be the dumbest guy in the room, but when we're talking iron ore flows and coal flows <laughs> and future trajectories, you know that's where I can add some insight. So yeah, with with dry bulk, um, look, this is a different type of industry than we have here with with container liners. It's a very spot focused, boom and bust. You know, three months hot, three months cold, six months up, six months down. And there's not really any long-term contracts on these vessels. There's a sporadic, you know, the one you know, miner will hire a, a Cape size ship for six months or something like that. But there's just not the cash flow visibility that we see in the container ship sector. And it, it has the most in common, I would say, from an investment standpoint with tankers. It, it's really just a commodity play. Um, there's not a lot of consolidation. Um, the biggest company in the world of dry bulk shipping owns less than 1% of the fleet uh, globally. Uh, so it's really just a true commodity sector. Why we like dry bulk is that the forward supply, looking at the order book for 22, 23, 24, is the lowest it's ever been uh, in terms of percentages. And so all we need is for demand to live up half of its bargain, right? I mean, a lot of folks are focused on China, talking about the property sector, Evergrande, what's going on there, uh, what's going on with your pollution controls, their energy crisis this winter, the Olympics, all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of noise. And there's a lot of bearish you know, or, or skepticism about China. I think a lot of that, or we think as a team at Value Investors Edge, a lot of that skepticism is already priced into the stocks. So as long as China doesn't face plant in 22, and you know, anything's possible, but as long as they don't face plant, I, I think dry bulk's going to have a pretty good year. And if China surprises us, if China ends up having a decent to strong 22 and 23, uh, dry bulk's going to be off to the races. It's going to be a rocket. But I, I, I caution about the commodity side of things because these are these investments are a little bit riskier. They're you know some of the container ship names, and we'll do top picks later and, and talk more about the companies themselves. But some of the dry bulk names are, are a little bit riskier. 
Yeah. And, and like you said, with the commodities, it's always, I mean, you make your profit when it peaks. I, I mean, that's, you know, people in the tanker industry did it in early 2020. We saw that and you make all your money then. And, and basically it's, it's, it's kind of just surviving until you hit those. And, and you definitely see that. But I, I agree with you when, when you look at ship construction right now and who's building what ships in what areas, that's a big one. You know, one of the big things in the shipping industry that, that goes across all the sectors is also this issue of decarbonization of engine plants, the IMO 2050 rules, and really pushing uh, this level, which is going to cause a fleet change in the future. But, but that's out there a bit. And so, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, replacement vessels right now are being put on hold until they can identify what the new fuel is going to be, what's the new propulsion plants. But commodities, like you said, th this is always an interesting aspect to look at how much is being moved. And, and again, where the development is, there's a political side to it. Australia gets in a, a, an argument with, with China. And now all of a sudden, you know, shipments out of Western Australia dry up. And now all of a sudden, Brazil and Argentina speed, speed up. But then you have low river uh, uh, levels in Argentina. You can't get grain out. So, or you have a railway washout in Vancouver, and, and now you can't get grain out of Vancouver. So it, it's really interesting to watch. And like you said, with any commodity, it's always a spot. It, it, it's, you just don't know. But if you're in at the right time or able to get in quickly enough, I, I always think that's, that's the thing that you can look at. You can see where the market's going to go with some good knowledge, which I, I, I always recommend for you for that. Uh, let's jump over to tankers. Absolutely. And yeah, and just one last thing on bulkers, I think this segues in the tankers is, you know, we don't know exactly what the demand picture is going to look like in 22 and 23, right? Everyone has the projections and we can look at the different countries and the different flows. But, you know, what I've seen in the last decade of success with shipping investments is it's about placing those bets in areas where the returns are lopsided. You know, look, if, if dry bulk has a terrible year, my dry bulk stocks lose 20%. If they have a great year, they're three baggers. Right. So like, and then you got to think about what's the odds of a good year versus a bad year. And, you know, we're at the point where it's, you know, maybe almost a head coin toss, good year, bad year, and bad years down 20 and good years of two or three baggers. So those are the kind of bets we make. And, and that's why I just caution folks. It's not like a, it's different than containers. Containers, a lot of these companies have guaranteed locked in cash flows. It's a lot easier to model. Uh, you can almost, I can almost tell you, you know, this is the 2022 earnings. This is probably the 23 earnings and so forth. Um, with tankers, it's, it's similar to dry bulk. It's a, it's a commodity industry, but unlike bulk, which is kind of doing, you know, decent, tankers are doing terrible. Uh, tankers are at, uh, I would say, the absolute bottom. Uh, maybe they're a month or two past the absolute bottom. I, I guess you could argue that the worst of the worst was maybe September, October of 2021. Uh, tankers, for those who haven't followed us closely, got slammed from both ends. They got slammed from the man crashing because of COVID. And the oil push out of the OPEC countries fell off because OPEC was very rational, very restrained. They cut their oil exports. So you have less demand pull for oil. You have less supply push for oil. Uh, you just need less tankers. And, you know, tankers are a commodity. They're just floating around the world. And so rates went from, you know, about 30,000 per day for VLCCs prior to COVID. They surged up to as high as 220, 230,000 a day during the COVID uh, zero oil price, <laughs> floating storage debacle. That Dude, lasted. If I could have filled my boat up with oil, I would have done it. Just, yeah. just, just to charter. I'm pretty sure. If I got a 19 crazy. foot boat, I would have filled it up with oil. Like <laughs> yeah, you probably could have made like 10 grand on your little <laughs> dinghy there. But uh, yeah, no, it was crazy. But it was only for two months, and then the rates crashed. You know, overnight, yeah. back down to like 10,000. And then last, uh, I said the worst was probably September, October 2021. Some of the rates were zero or negative, the way we quote them. And they're not actually negative, but it, when you subtract out the operating costs, right. they basically amount to negative free cash flow. So it was a brutal, brutal time. The times are still brutal. Uh, the Q4 reports coming out in the next few weeks are going to be brutal. Uh, a lot of these companies are burning cash. Um, we believe the turnaround is likely to be mid to late 2022. Originally, we thought there was maybe like a 50-50 chance that things could recover by Christmas of this year. But with the emergence of Omicron, with the you know, continued political uh, situation with, with air traffic and, and all the restrictions like we saw with you know, South Africa and Europe and, and all that sort of thing, uh, global oil, uh, air traffic just hasn't picked back up. And OPEC has been very restrained. I mean, they've stuck to their plan. There's no cheating. <laughs> I mean, OPEC always cheats. And, and yet for you know, the last few years, they haven't cheated. So I mean, good for OPEC but uh, not good for our oil tanker investments. Um, I, think there's a, I think there's a chance though, and I would say a pretty high chance that that recovers by mid to late uh, 2022. 
Yeah, and I, I think I think there's a I mean there's a huge doubt on on what oil consumption is going to be around the world because again, do we fundamentally shift the way we go to work, for example, which cuts down on driving? You know, all a lot there's so many factors out there that don't know. And if you look at the tanker companies right now, they're scrapping like crazy. I, I mean, they're just you know bleeding vessels right now to get off their books. They can't sell them, so the you know scrapping becomes the option. And again, what you're doing is is reducing, especially the VLCCs. I mean, VLCCs, ULCCs, the very large and the super tankers that we're talking about are, are on the way out. They're just too big. They they use for floating storage more than anything else right now. And if there's no floating storage for them, they're just huge holes in the ocean for some of these companies unless they can get rid of them. So it's going to be interesting to see where they go. Uh, what about the LNG sector? I mean, that's I mean, it's been in the news like crazy. LNG being exported. There's, I mean, the U.S. just surpassed Qatar and Australia as the leading LNG exporter in the world. So you get this big competition between three very unique nations in this area. You've got LNG ships heading to Europe as, as never before. So uh, I don't know what's your view on 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 that sector. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. We, we actually cover the LNG and LPG uh, gas sectors very closely. Um, it's just usually, you know, when I simplify things for folks, you know, it's kind of the big three, you know, tankers, bulk, and, right. and, uh, and containers. But no, um, LNG is just a phenomenal global macro growth story. It's, it's not just cyclical, it's secular. And it's going to be a growth story for the next decade, if not longer. Uh, it, how long it grows and how robust is really going to depend on how the EU and, and some other countries and groups, uh, UN, of course, uh, categorize natural gas. Is it going to be accepted as a transition fuel? You know, are, are countries going to buy into this and say, okay, we realize natural gas has carbon emissions, but there's no way to phase out coal and there's no way to do all these other things unless we whole, wholeheartedly accept natural gas on a limited timeline. Maybe that's only, you know, 2021 through 2040, right? But right now there's been a lot of resistance uh, from the EU and the United Nations and, and so forth about accepting natural gas as a bridge fuel. So that's kind of the big long picture that, 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 that determines the political factor determines how long the secular growth is going to be. It, it's interesting. I literally just did a video on this on that's going to, uh, was just released on Wednesday. And one of the things I talked about in looking at it is, is of course, New England, which is very dependent on LNG. They've phased out nuclear power. About half their nuclear power plants have been shut down. They're transitioning from coal and oil plants over to LNG. Our biggest importers of American LNG is Korea, uh, Japan, and China. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Koreans are going big in LNG. They've just really embraced it as, as, as a power source. But you're right. EU is, is, is the, really the big variable up there. And you see that in the news with the Russian gas. I think that's really the big issue for them is Russian gas mm -hmm. and the alternatives out there. And I, I think it's it's been really amazing to watch how that sector has gone. And in the United States, it's just been this huge just uptick from 2016. I think I think we exported a, a billion cubic uh, feet of LNG in 2015, and we're over 10 billion now. And you just you just see that sector growing in, in terms of that. But uh, yeah, I think. Uh, the LNG tankers are going to be really ish, uh, interesting to watch. So Jay, let me, let me get you to put your thinking cap on. So we're going into 2022. Here it is January, 2022. You know, what, what's your uh, forecast? What are we looking at as we, you know, sitting here, you know, in the first quarter, looking at the year ahead? Yeah. So I guess I'll hit the big three because this LNG and LPG are a little bit more niche and, and each, each company is so much different than the others. Uh, they're not quite as commoditized. So for the containers, I, I kind of mentioned, I think, you know, rates um, were either past the very high peaks or definitely, you know, eighth or ninth inning on the rates. Um, in terms of the stocks, you know, I think we're sixth, seventh inning, somewhere in there. Um, there's a lot of skepticism, a wall of worry to climb. But I think as far as risk reward investments, I think container ships have the potential to be one of our best returners again in, in 2022. And when I say that, I mean the liners, like Zim would be one of those. I'm very long Zim, personally. Uh, Matson's another no position there. Um, and then, of course, the ship lessors like Denaus Corp, DAC is a position we have. Um, some of the box lessors, the companies that take those 40 foot boxes, buy them, finance them, and give them to the container liners, companies like Textainer Group, TGH, we're along that one. Um, those have the potential to be one of our best returns in 2022. Um, I think from a risk reward standpoint, because we're not really taking as much risk with these companies. A lot of their cash flows are locked in or virtually guaranteed. The valuations are low. So they might not be a two bagger, three bagger, four bagger, anything crazy, but we might be able to get a 30, 40, 50% almost a layup without a lot of risk. So that's my view on container ships. I think they're going to do well for us. Um, but I think the rates, we're probably past the peak on rates by now. Yeah. And if I just add in there, you know, because I, I, I think I think you're exactly right, you know, and I think we've got a lot of issues still on the horizon 
coming in, obviously on, on the West Coast uh, and, and even shipments out of Asia. You've got the Chinese New Year early this year, February 1st. You've got a longshoreman renegotiation on the West Coast. So a lot of container, a lot of shippers are going to be front loading 2022, trying to get their goods onto the West Coast before that renegotiation in case it breaks down for it. But one of the things you saw the container liners do is really renegotiate rates, lock in rates long term. Because I think a lot of shippers were concerned that this fluctuation is going to continue and they don't want to get caught in a spot market. Market where you know you and I saw you know some insane rate thirty two thousand dollars for a box or some some insane rate they would much rather lock in even though it's going to be three times higher than it was pre COVID they much rather have a guaranteed rate like that and so yeah I agree it, you know containers are in a much different condition than we've seen them in in the past and and, and that's definitely uh, I, I absolutely agree with what you said on that I'll, I'll let you continue. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to say blue chip because <laughs> there's probably not anything blue chip in shipping, no. but a company like Textain or TGH is as close to a blue chip as you can get um, in shipping. So I, I think the company like that as well. And if we have time later, maybe we can do a roundup of some of the topics overall, but that's yeah. my container ship uh, outlay. Uh, for dry bulk, look, I, I hate to say it like this and kind of like not accept uh, a strong prediction, but it's kind of a coin toss. I don't personally really know um, how dry bulk is going to do in 2022. So much depends on China. And so much depends on how they're able to stabilize their property sector, where they want to go with some of their environmental regulations, uh, how they're going to handle the coal conflict with Australia, um, all those sorts of things, lots of moving parts. But I think the stocks are attractive because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, worst case, they go down 20, 25 percent. Best case, they're doubles or triples. Right. So but I, but I can't tell you it's going to be a great year for dry bulk. I just really can't. Um, my favorite dry bulk pick, though, I mentioned that one is Eagle Bulk, E-G-L-E. Uh, they handle all the mid-sized dry bulk ships. So U.S. listed, U.S. headquartered, U.S. management team. No corporate governance issues to worry about. I know sometimes that's a concern with shipping companies. Not the ones that we pick and cover, but there are some out there that I wouldn't touch with a uh, 10-foot pole, as it were. But Eagle Bulk's a solid one. They have an active dividend. They have an active repurchase program. Uh, they trade about 65% of their net asset value. So if they just like liquidated the fleet tomorrow and, and, and just gave shareholders all the cash returns, you, you'd make, if you think about 100 over 65, you'd make almost a 50% return just from liquidation. So we like that one a lot, even though we don't really know if the market's going to be strong or not. It, it's funny, you know, and I think I mentioned this to you at one time, just us communicating together. Eagle, for me, is, is an interesting company just because during the whole height of covid their corporate governance was amazing because they literally chartered airplanes for crew changes. I mean, that's the, the, the concern they had. Actually, you, they lost money on it. They, they, they spent a lot of money to do it. But one of the things they did was an improved crew efficiency. They, they markedly, you know, they track this kind of stuff and they were able actually to pull a, a much a more effective, it cost them a lot of money back when crews couldn't get off. And then here's this company. Well, the, the CEO was say, I don't care. I'm going to spend this money, which I know some investors don't like to hear. But man, it, it created an efficiency in the company that, that has, I think, translated into their ability to work. And I agree with you. It's going to be, you know, like I said, if it hits, it's going to hit big. And, and that, that's always the thing with bulk. Go ahead yeah. with the tankers. Yeah. And, and just to follow on Eagle, you know, that's important for us as investors. Obviously, we're looking at nickels and dimes sometimes, but it's important at the end of the day that these companies are doing the right thing. Uh, they're not polluting, right? They're respecting their workers. They're giving their workers fair and equitable salaries and that sort of thing. So it, it really was great to hear some of the good things that Eagle was doing. And, and some of the other companies that we've invested in have also been doing great things with, with their crew and crew changes and that sort of thing. And, and uh, so I think a big X factor out there that nobody can plan on is is the crews and, and what have it's been two years now of COVID and it's had you know a big effect on 1.6 million seafarers out there. And and you know, if all of a sudden you know ships stop sailing because the crews go on strike, that yeah. throws everybody off financially, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so turning to tankers, um, uh, tankers I'm a little bit more certain and confident about the trajectory, uh, simply because rates can't get any worse than they are today. So um, you know, if we talk again in a year, I will almost guarantee you that tanker rates are markedly higher. Now, are they, you know, fifty thousand a day and we're, you know, cash cows, or is it, you know, they went from eight thousand to twelve thousand? I I don't know the exact magnitude, but I can tell you for sure that tankers are a recovery play, a turnaround play. Um, a lot of the tanker companies though are still burning cash. Um, some of them have fleets that we just don't find very attractive. Uh, maybe the liquidity is a little bit tighter, uh, things like that. So the one company that we're really excited about in tankers is International Seaways, INSW. Another U.S. headquartered, U.S. listed, U.S. management team, strong corporate governance. Uh, they have an active repurchase program. They just re announced about a week ago, a week and a half ago, that they repurchased a million shares, uh, which is about two, a little bit more than 2% of their shares. Um, they have a huge liquidity catalyst coming mid-22. 
even if the tanker markets don't recover, they have these, uh, they're called FSOs, um, floating oil servicing platforms yeah. that work in the Middle East. And, and these are on contract um, until 2032. So fixed rate, fixed contract, fixed free cash flow. Um, and in 2022, their legacy debt is fully repaid on those joint ventures. So they can either sell the joint venture to another party, or they can refinance, you know, take out another five to 10 year loan against the guaranteed free cash flows. And we, we believe there's about 100 to $150 million of free cash flow that's going to come out of that, either by selling it, which would be closer to 150, or refinancing, which would probably be closer to 100 million. And so they can take that joint venture, it'll be debt-free. They add their financing on it. It's totally, it's totally sectioned off. It's not at risk of international seaways. Then they pay themselves a dividend and suddenly, you know, INSW has all this cash. And so I think they're going to continue repurchases and those sorts of things. So that's, that's the one company where I can really get excited about in tankers. A lot of the other ones, I'm like, well, you know, we'll see what we see. No, I, I think you're right. And, and, you know, those FSOs going out into, you know, guitars, developing those fields, that a lot of development out there. We, we saw basically dry up in the Gulf of Mexico because of fracking in the United States. And so, you know, what had been offshore oil had really d diminished quite a bit in the United States, but that's not the case out in Asia, the Middle East right now, where you see just massive amounts going on right there. And, you know, companies that are getting in those contracts now and really locking in. Again, that's what, that's what we're seeing with liner service, with the containers, those long-term prospects, lock-in lo uh, rates, lock-in long contracts. And same thing with, with the, the non-owner uh, operators out there like Danos, you know, I think they've got their ships charted out to what, 2025, some cases. I mean, they're building a whole new class, 18 vessels, and they're all chartered. I mean, they're even, I think only one's come out yet. And, and they're out there. So yeah, I, I agree. Definitely a, a lot to see out there. And like you said, tankers being at the bottom can mean it can only go one way. And when we say tankers are at the bottom, we mean the bottom. They're, they're, they're at zero. I mean, it's yeah. just, you, you really yeah, have to- Free cash flow is zero or if not negative right now. So yeah, yeah we're, in, we're in tough straits for tankers. So let, let's wrap up. Let's talk about you know your picks and, and, and some of your favorite ideas coming uh, up for uh, 2022. So uh, what, what's your pro prospects there, Jay? So we'll start with, I guess, like best risk reward and maybe less covered, and then we'll end up with the more exciting trading names. So I got about five names I'll share. Sure. Um, long all these names, they're not investment recommendations, of course. I have talking my book, as it were. Um, you know, we're recording this right now on January 5th, 2022. I don't know when the video is going to be posted, but keep in mind, if you're watching this in a week or two weeks, you're probably the same position. But if you're watching this in several months, you know, positions can change. Um, with that said, the, I think the most exciting name we have from a risk rewards, almost like a blue chip perspective, a company that just most people have never even heard of is Text, uh, Textainer Group, TGH. Now, this company is pretty boring. They're a financial structuring play. They buy these metal boxes from China. And these metal boxes have about a 15-year serviceability life. And what they would normally do is they would buy the boxes, they would get attractive bank financing at like maybe 80% leverage. And then they would uh, lease out these boxes to companies like Maersk, uh, CMA, CGM, even Zim. Um, and they would usually do, you know, four or five, six year terms. And then at four or five, six years, the liners would come back and say, well, okay, we want to keep that box. We'll renew it for another five, six years. And they would do that a couple of times. And when it would get to 15 years, they'd sell it. Well, the market right now and the last year and a half really has been so tight so strong for these container boxes that these liners like Maersk and CMA CGM are agreeing to unprecedented terms. They're agreeing to leases of 12, 13, 14 years in duration. We've never seen something like this. So basically they're saying, you buy the box or you're the only one that has it, we'll guarantee you the entire lifetime of that box in, in service fees. It, it really de-risks the company a lot. Um, we believe a company like this should trade anywhere from 10 to 12 earnings. They trade around five to six. Um, so, you know, if that's a simplistic uh, metric, but if you look at that metric, you could say the stock could double. Uh, right now, I think it trades around, I want to say about 37. I don't have the chart right in front of me. Um, our fair value estimate at Value Investor Edge is 55. Uh, so we're a little bit more conservative than that double I talked about. That would still be about nine times earnings. And keep in mind, it's nine times earnings, but these boxes are locked in on 12, 13, 14 year contracts. So a little long winded, but I think it's because a lot of people haven't really heard of that one. No, you know, you know and I, 
I, I did a video on this. Greg Miller did a great story over at Freightways where he looked at, at, I think it was at the five companies that are really involved in containers. And, and this all goes back to the container lines back in 2008, divesting themselves of their own boxes. You know, they got out of leasing their own boxes. And so you have these companies that are running these boxes now for them, just as you explained. And then you have the fact that basically 85% of all boxes were built in China and they're really limiting the number of boxes that are being built. Uh, China has really restricted that number. So there's a finite number of boxes right now. I talked to a lot of people who can't get their hands on a container just to store stuff in or do anything with. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I think it's really interesting aspect. We tend to focus on the ships, you know, they're the big things, but man, containers are those key individual things that, that have draw, driven this. And I think it's one of the big impetuses that I talk about why they're trying to get empties back to Asia so much is because they need those boxes. They're in such short supply. They're dying to get them back there. And, and you know, these investments in a company like this is a perfect example of that. And it's how all these pieces kind of fit together. Yeah, there's just not a lot of, it's not like some of these other companies where there's risk in 24 or 25. You know, I can look at a company like TGH and say, I know for a fact, I mean, there could be bankruptcies or counterparty risk in, in a decade. I don't know what's going to happen in a decade, but I know based on their contracts that 22 is going to be higher than 21, 23 is higher than 22. I mean, I can model out a decade worth of free cash flows. Um, and so these are really like blue chips and, and, and I can't say the same, unfortunately, for a lot of the other stocks. So that's that's kind of the big risk reward one. I don't think a lot of folks are talking about it yet. The stock price has been kind of flat for the last seven, eight months. Um, on a more sort of um, turnaround or speculative play, I've already mentioned these companies, but they're worth talking about again real quick. Uh, Eagle Bulk, EGLE on the dry bulk side. Um, that's our favorite play. They do the midsize bulk. So they're not quite as exposed to China. I mean, indirectly, China is going to matter, right? But the trade uh, routes that they do are much more middle market. A lot more uh, countries are involved. Whereas if you look at Cape sizes, the large dry bulk vessels, that's all Australia, China, Brazil, China. I mean, it's all iron ore, a little bit of coal. Uh, Eagle bulk is way more diversified. They're doing forestry products, grains, bauxite, coal, everything. So, so we like Eagle. We already talked about their management. Sal, you and I both understand that's one of the best management teams in the yeah. business. Um, the other one I talked about a lot, so I won't rehash too much, but International Seaways, and that's our favorite tanker play. Um, it's not the most levered. So look, if tankers recover, and you're like 100% guaranteed, like, I believe that tankers will recover by June 22, right? There's probably other names where you can make more money, right? That's not how we profit. You know, we've been in the sector for almost a decade with Value Investors Edge for six. It's not about going for the biggest returners. It's about setting up your risk reward in a favorable notion. If you're wrong, you only lose a little bit. If you're right, you still double, triple your money. And that's, that's why we like international seaways because if we're right and the tanker market turns around, I can easily see that stock being 25 to 30, maybe even 32, 33 by next year. If we're wrong and tankers don't recover, it already trades at 60% net asset value. They already have a liquidity catalyst. They're already repurchasing shares. So I could see a scenario, I might be wrong, Sal, we'll talk in a year and maybe I'll embarrass myself, but I could see a scenario where tankers suck in 22. I mean, they're a terrible segment, 22. International Seaway still goes up. I could see a, seg a scenario where the tanker market is abysmal and that stock still goes from 15 to 20. I mean, the risk reward is off the charts. Um, and then we'll talk about more exciting plays. Zim, Z-I-M, Zim Integrated Shipping. That's really the most exciting, fascinating play in shipping right now. But it has a different risk reward profile. It's connected 100% to those spot freight rates. Uh, Zim could be a hundred, $150 stock. Uh, Zim could languish, right? We don't 100% know yet. I believe that freight rates are going to be stronger in 22 than they were in 21. If I'm correct on my belief and my assumption, I think Zim's going to be a triple digit stock. I think we could break $100 by summer or fall of 22, but it's a little bit more risky. It's not, it's kind of at the opposite end of like a TGH. TGH is like the safest. INSW and Eagle are kind of in the middle of risk reward and Zim is a little bit more, you know, I'm throwing my chips in. But look, Zim trades it. I mean, what's the trade today? 56, 57. Um, they have over $30 in cash on the balance sheet. They don't have any traditional debt. They're generating a dollar per share in free cash flow every week. So, I mean, we'll be the, we'll be the 56 or 57 in cash by like May or June at this, at this rate. So, I mean, it's, it's not like a, it's not overvalued or anything. It's just a little bit more risky. And I think folks need to be aware of that. You know, I, I agree. I, I think you know, on the tanker side, getting in now on the bottom, you know, if you're in there long term, you know, you will see money in the end. You know, it may not be this year, it may not be, you know, even next year, like you said, but you'll, you'll definitely see it. Zim to me is really interesting. I, I have a, a lot of questions about what Zim's going to do with their money. Because like you said, they come into this or the past year 
IPO, they open up, you know, they only own one ship, they lease everything else, but now they're talking about buying ships, you know, how do they spend the profits that they're having right now? You know, what do they do with that is really interesting. I, I, I'm really interested in Matson. I know you mentioned Matson earlier. For me, Matson is really unique. They're in a very unique trade. They're a Jones Act trade. They, they, they're locked in. They're the only ones that can move cargo between basically West Coast, Hawaii, and, and Alaska. This is another company, Pasha, but Matson just did a uh, replacement program for their vessels. They got four brand new vessels, which they can pay off now because they're making profits. They're leasing vessels for the China service, bringing in, and, and probably the best thing of all is, is because they're running smaller vessels, they can get in and out of the big ports a lot easier. Their, their reliability has been amazing to watch where some companies have really dropped in their reliability, Evergreen and a few of the other ones. Mm -hmm. they, they've been really consistent. So, you know, that's my little tidbit. But again, I'm a historian. Don't take financial advice from me. Yeah, please, no, please Matt, don't. <laughs> we really like Matson as a company. Um, you know, the valuations for Matson, uh, they trade around, you know, four to five to six times earnings, somewhere in that range. Uh, Zim trades between one and two. So from a leverage perspective and, and playing the spot rates, we definitely prefer Zim. But from a longer term business, I uh, absolutely agree with you. They have an edge in the Jones Act business. And look, there's two companies globally who have dominated the 2021 supply chain game. The two best companies in the world, in my opinion, uh, in, in terms of investors, in terms of like returning money for their investors, have been number one, I think, Zim by far. I mean, they, they do almost doubled the size of their fleet into the recovery because they believed in it so much. And the other one is Matson. They set up these really neat uh, niche express lines from China to LA, and that wasn't a core business for them, right? Their core business was Jones Act US, but they saw this coming and they got ahead of it. And Matson has just done such great things for their shareholders. Oh, and they have an active repurchase program. Which, is, which has been great. And, and that's something that Zim hasn't done yet. We think they're going to do it in the next few months, but they haven't done it yet. So yeah, two thumbs up for Matson. Uh, we don't currently have a position, but I, I'm very uh, happy with what that company's done. Yeah, you know, they, they were able to get some smaller vessels and, and, you know, they really, you know, they get into Long Beach, they get in a very unique area in Long Beach because there's a, they just did a replacement bridge in Long Beach, but they haven't tore down the old bridge yet. So you can't get underneath there unless you have a smaller vessel. And they knew that and that's what they went for. And they're using their facility in Long Beach and they're able to move very effectively. They got their own container fleet of boxes too. So they got their own box fleet they manage. Uh, it, it's definitely a, a unique company to, to kind of take a look at. And again, you know, it's these little tid, tidbits of information. I think they're always really interesting. So Jay, I, I want to kind of wrap up and, and talk about how we can follow you. I follow you on, on, on Twitter all the time and, and I look forward to your tweets all the time. And, and you and I always have fun together on, on, on that platform, but I know you're, you're available in other ways. How can my viewers get in touch with you, get your advice on a consistent basis? And if they're interested in dabbling into shipping stocks, what's their best course for getting up with you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sal. And, and you know, get the graphics up later. But you know, the easiest thing for free is to follow me on Twitter, as you do, at Mincemeyer. Um, you know, it's a it's a fun, uh, complicated name, but really, you know, Mintzmeyer, M-I-N-T-Z-M-Y-E-R, we'll get it up on the screen. That's yeah. the easiest thing. You can no Tupper de Mercagliano, so you're good. <laughs> yeah, we're, I'm in good company, right? Um, and then it, you're, if you're interested in the actual research, the product that we deliver, and that's where I told you the 136% model portfolio um, that we pr that we produced in 2021. We have picks and fresh model portfolios available for 2022. We actually have free trials open. Uh, we only do these about once or twice a year. We have a free trial and promotion program. We have free trials open until January 10th. Uh, so if you go to mincemeyer.com, same spelling, and we'll get that on the screen. Uh, you can go there, you check it out. We have free trials open uh, until basically the middle of next week. And, and you can see what we do. You can see the platform that we have. Uh, we have 15 uh, e exclusive industry interviews that are going on the second and third week of January. So we actually have the CEOs and CFOs of these companies who are going to come onto our platform and we'll interview them live and members can ask questions. And so you can tell I'm getting excited. Uh, we have a lot uh, planned out for 22. And Sal, I hope we can continue this uh, collaboration both ways because I've learned so much from you and, and I hope you've learned a little bit from us in terms of the stocks. And you know, this has been really fun today. No, it, it, I think it's a, it's a very good symbiotic relationship. I enjoy it a lot. And listen, uh, Jay's been really kind to me. He sent me, you know, his annual review letter. He sent me some, you know, his products. And I got to say, I'm impressed by what he's provided to me. And, and you know, this service, I think, is, is if you're really interested in diving in. And, and let me be clear, J Jay's exactly right. The shipping industry has been up and down over the past history. Just because we're talking about profits right now, and we're talking about profits in 2021, you know, that hasn't always been the case. And, and you got to be smart. You know, you got to be careful about where you put your money and where you think about doing it. And, you know, you can follow Jay, you can follow me, but believe me, there's a lot of research that goes on behind the scenes to know this. You know, I have a lot of people who are deep in the weeds in, in the operational side knowing this. Jay's got people on the financial side 
who knows this. And, and you know, I, I always hesitate before recommending anything. But, you know, I, I think being educated, one of the things I try to do with this channel is bring more information out there and make it readily available to you. I always have in my show notes all the information where you can go to check up on me. I am not perfect. I make mistakes. You can ask my wife. She'll tell you immediately that I make mistakes all the time. And, and Jay will tell you, you know, listen, there's no guarantees. It's, it's always a risk. The economy can drop tomorrow, unfortunately, and then everything goes out the window. But you know what, you know, I think one of the things about shipping is people are learning about it. It's in the news, you know, ever since ever given one ashore in the, in the Suez, ever since the, the situation off of LA, people are realizing, listen, how interconnected we are and we're not going to be not interconnected. And, and shipping is the thing that does that. So Jay, I want to appreciate you coming on and I appreciate you taking the time and, and, and doing this with us. And I'm looking forward to doing this again in the near future. We do this again and take a look at how things are going because again, this is a very dynamic industry as we know. There are a lot of forces at play. Uh, the market changes, you know, and, and maybe after half a year, we come back and take a look at it, see where we are heading into the third quarter of 2022. What's our prospects, you know, after we hit the peak there in the summertime and, and going into the fall, I think it's gonna be a really interesting time to take a look at. Jay, anything else you want to add before we wrap up our interview here? No, absolutely. Happy New Year, Sal. It's been great being on your channel. Big fan. I'm glad I could uh, join the channel. And I think the mid-22 follow-up is perfect. Let's see. Hopefully uh, I come out, we come out looking smart, <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, well, mid-22, I think that's great timing. You know, as I, as I always tell my students, you just got to be one, you know, as, as a professor, I've learned, you just got to be one chapter ahead of your students and you, you look like a genius all the time. And so, you know, that's part of financial is you got to be one chapter ahead of everybody else. You know, and if you can jump in just before everybody else does, that makes you the winner in lots of ways. So I want to thank Jay and we're going to have all his contact information right up here for you. We'll post it right in this video and in the show notes as we went along. Please follow him on Twitter. If you're interested in, in uh, getting his services, please subscribe to him. He's great. I, I strongly recommend him. Both he and John, uh, both myself and John Conrad recommend him very strongly. Talked about him in the video. It's one of the reasons we want to get him on. And if you enjoy this video, take a minute, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell. Also subscribe over to Jay's YouTube channel, hit the bell there. So you'll be alerted about his videos when they come out. I watch them when they come out. 30 minutes for me listening to Jay is great. I enjoy it immensely all the time when he does them. I don't think he does them enough, but, but that's just me. Uh, subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. And if you want, leave a comment and we'll be sure to get Jay back on here later in the year. So until our next episode, this is myself and Jay signing off. Thanks.